Hi, my name is Scott Simmons, and I'm a toolbox for turning lawyers into rainmakers. I provide lawyers with the tips and techniques to get out to the marketplace, give their clients the best advice, and win more work. I coach clients on subjects including mindset, leadership, culture, habits. I train lawyers in how to sell and cross sell, how to network confidently, and give the kind of presentations that people like and enjoy listening. And I consult for law firms on how to develop business development strategies. And most importantly, get those strategies out into the marketplace so they can build organically as a foundation for the future. Now, in this video, I'm going to demystify business development. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know. Here I am today talking to you about how you as lawyers can sell legal services in the 21st century and why it's so important that law firms adopt a culture of business development. So Claire, can we have slide two, please? Sure. All right. So I'm going to talk to you today about three topics. Number one, what is selling and why is it so important? Number two, cross selling to existing clients. And number three, outbound selling. But before we go into what selling is, we need to have a look at why lawyers need to learn how to sell legal services in the 21st century. Now, the legal industry is changing at a pace like never before, and there are factors that are forcing this change. There are slide three, please. So here they are. Here are the five trends. So number one, increased competition. Increased competition requires a differentiation that can't be met any longer by claiming to have a USP. Number two is technology. And in particular, I'm talking here about the advancement of AI. What this means is that lawyers have to understand not just traditional sectors, but how technology is impacting them. Number three is a new generation of business owners. Now, new businesses are being created every single day by a new generation of owners that expect their lawyers to be more reflective of who they are and how they work. Number four is agile working. Now, COVID-19 has only sped up what's becoming increasingly inevitable, and that's the need for flexible working and a workforce that can and is allowed to work from anywhere. And number five, is equality. Now, 25% of UK high growth companies are female led, and 48% of startup loans that were advanced by the British Business Bank to London companies alone since 2012 are led by members of the BAME community. Now, these trends are raising questions that the legal industry needs to start thinking about. And they include things like how do we differentiate in a time of increased competition? How do we keep up with the changes that are coming about by technology and understand the new disruptors into the sectors? How do we meet the increased demand for agile working? And how do we better reflect the changing leadership in our client base, as well as the client, the, the, those that we want to engage with? Now, all of these trends, they're raising questions that require change to happen now. And those that don't are simply just going to be left behind in a new age. And so much can be achieved in these regards by actually empowering lawyers to understand their clients and prospects better by having the skills that we've never previously been taught, but are so, so vital. And actually, what we need to do before we start thinking about what selling in the legal industry is, is actually understand the difference between marketing and, uh, and business development. Now, a brilliant woman a number of years ago, my wife, explained the difference to me like this. She said, marketing is drawing the horse to water, business development is making it drink. So marketing are all those activities that spark an interest in a law firm and attract leads to you. So brand building, advertising, social media, this webinar, 
They're all forms of promotion that speak to larger groups of people. Now, business development, on the other hand, is what you do to convert those leads into clients. So we're thinking about relationship management on a much smaller scale. We're digging deeper with individuals or, or much smaller groups. It's those scoping conversations that you should be having with your clients. It's the it's your pitch, it's your presentations that you give to clients. It's understanding your clients' goals and needs in order to find solutions and give them the best advice. And I have to say, it's really, really, really important that we make this distinction between marketing and business development because very often when we say business development what we end up talking about is marketing <clears throat> so we need to dig a bit further now so we need to start thinking about what business development is in the 21st century now i would imagine that most people who are here today are completely comfortable using the phrase cross-selling, talking about the need to cross-sell within firms, that some of us do cross-sell and some of us need to do it better. But then if I just take out the word cross from cross-sell or cross-selling, well, we start to feel a bit more awkward, don't we? Lawyers selling? Uh, I don't think so, matey. We don't know. But we have to be honest here. Business development is selling. No matter how you argue it, BD is selling. But what we have to remember is that this isn't selling in the door-to-door -door sense. This isn't trying to persuade clients to buy things they don't need. This isn't the Wolf of Wall Street. As much as we all love that film, we are not trying to convince people to, to buy a pen. 21st century business development is what's called consultative selling. It's getting to know your client so that you can give them what they need, even sometimes when they don't even realize they need it. And a really good example of this actually is a client who comes to their lawyer about their business. The lawyer takes a look at their website, discovers that it's got no privacy policies, no GDPR advice, no website terms and conditions, that lawyer has an obligation to their client to educate them on the need for these things. And yet we don't feel dirty doing that. We don't feel like we're tricking the client into buying them, into getting them. And yet what that lawyer has done is they have sold to them. So we need to break out of this idea that lawyers don't sell. You do, it's as simple as that but we need to start reframing what selling means. Selling is business development. Business development is consultative selling and consultative selling is serving your client's needs. Think of it that way and you're never gonna have to sell ever again. Now, you put your content out into the world in the hope that prospects will respond by making contact with you. That's marketing. The sales element requires you to be able to close the client, to win the client. Your content alone isn't going to do that. And there's still plenty to do to turn those prospects into clients. So before I get into the two main types of sales, understanding the principles of how to sell, particularly selling legal services in the 21st century, is going to be key to how our industry moves forward. Clara, could you bring up slide four, please? OK, so simply put, when I teach when I teach my clients how to sell, I split it into nine parts. It's what I call precision selling, and you can see them on the screen. I'm going to take you through very quickly what each of them are. So we start with pitch. That's being able to articulate your value proposition in an, in an elevator pitch within about, you know, sort of 30 seconds. Next up, you've got research. Undertaking research into your existing clients and prospects. After that, you've got encounter, the methods that we use to make contact. After that, you've got challenge, and that's the type of relationship you want to have with our clients. 
Next, got investigation. That's about asking the right questions to get the right information in order to be able to give the best advice. The next up, we've got silence. And that's understanding the importance of listening without any prejudgments. After that, you've got indecision. How do we handle objections that are going to come up? And what do those objections really mean? So that we've then got what I call open for closing, and that's getting a commitment from your client or prospect. And it's not always about winning the work, but it's about knowing what to do in order to get a decision or a commitment. And number nine, which I would say is easily the most important part, is what's called normality. It's making selling a part of your firm's culture. It has to be what we do as part of our day job. Now, these nine principles are what every lawyer needs to learn as we move into a new era for the legal profession. They're no longer soft skills. You will never, ever hear me refer to them as soft skills. They're human skills, but they are essential skills because they are the most essential skills a lawyer can have. And the reason for that is, is that we can't keep being the last to the party can't be coming along once the decision's already been made we can't be this commodity that can be easily discarded by clients and beaten down on fees we have to start being that strategic partner what's called a, a trusted advisor we hear it a lot now we have to the, have to start being them those strategic trusted advisors that clients feel are an important part of every strategic decision they make. And actually, this is the same whether they come to us as an individual or as a corporate client. So even buying your house, getting your will, you know, getting a divorce is a strategic decision in some way, shape or form. So we've now gone through the basics of selling. So let's get into our second topic for today, which is cross-selling. So I'm going to focus on cross-selling. And the reason for that is, is because the principles behind cross-selling apply equally to what's known as upselling and repeat selling. But the latter two just simply uh, apply to your own work. And if you're doing your own work well enough and you've got any kind of relationship with your clients, they will, at the very least, come back to you for the same job, repeat selling, and where appropriate, spend more money with you, upselling. Now, when we talk about cross-selling, what do we mean? So if we're thinking about product recommendations, you might think about things like, um, you might also like, or complete this look. Actually, a very simple example is, a waiter at a restaurant asking, would you like any sides with that? Clark, can we just get up slide five, please? I Let think I beat you to it on that one. Right, sorry. <laughs> now, here's the difference between cross-selling and, and upselling. What you've got there is on the, uh, you know, when we're talking about upselling, what you've got is you've got, you've bought a burger from a fast food restaurant. Can, you know, do you want to, do you want to go large, large with that? So that's upselling. On the other hand, when it comes to cross-selling, you've got, bought the burger, do you want chips and a drink with that? That is cross-selling. When we're talking about legal services, we're thinking about things like, you bought a house, have you got a will? Have you arranged your lasting power of attorney? Company acquisition takes place. The lawyers prepared a hundred, uh, the, the 100 days report. That 100 days report contains within it things that your client needs to act upon. And if you're, if you're, act, if you're helping your client act upon that, there will be colleagues that will be brought in to the work. That's cross-selling. And the reason it's so important is that, that cross-selling drives revenue. 
And the way that it does that is that it capitalizes on what the client is currently buying from you, using with you, by showing additional services that the client will also find useful. Now, the difference between companies that grow and those that don't is customer retention. The more clients that you can keep and continue to sell to, the more likely you are to achieve your business goals. Now, having said that, investment in client acquisition far exceeds investment in, reten in retention. But statistics show that selling to an existing client is six to seven times cheaper. If you're running a business, the number one priority is to find new ways to increase revenue. And at the end of the day, I think we need to remember that we're not running law firms, we are running legal businesses. So in order to do this, you need to sell more, which in turn means you need more clients. And what we fixate on is we fixate on gaining new clients. And what we then fail to do effectively is to address the need to retain the clients we've already got. As I just said, it's cheaper to retain a, an existing client than it is to acquire a new one. Now, according to the marketing metrics group, the success rate of selling to an existing client is 60 to 70%. Well, the success rate of selling to a new client is somewhere between 5 and 20%. And I want you to hold that in your thinking for a moment. Existing clients, your success rate will be somewhere between 60 to 70%. New clients, 5 to 20. Now, in order to improve our cross-selling skills, we have to understand why we lose clients to competitors. And there are five main reasons for this. Number one is complacency and a sense of entitlement. You know, I've had that client for 20 years. They'll always come to me. No matter what happens, I've got a good enough relationship with them. They'll always come to me. So that's number one. Number two is apathy, lack of communication. You know what? I'm, I'm at a point now where, you know, come see, come see. You know, it's, it's, It'll happen, it won't happen. The client will come to me, the client won't come to me. And actually you've stopped communicating with the client as much. Number three is resentment. You're at a point with your client where you're now negotiating all the time on fees, where the client feels, actually, I have to go through this dance of negotiating fees. Or, you know, they used to look after me a lot better than I feel I'm being looked after now. Number four, is new stakeholders. Now, a, a, a new CEO comes along, new finance director, new managing director, new GC comes along into a, into a client that you have worked with for a number of years. All of a sudden, that new stakeholder has got a contact base of their own and they like using them. So you're at risk of losing that client. Number five is long unaddressed needs and changes. You know a client has been dealing with issues for a number of years. You know it hasn't been resolved. And yet you don't say anything. Again, you're at risk of losing that client. And it's very simple. In my training courses, I teach lawyers how to steal your clients using one of these five reasons as a starting point. If I can ask the right questions, if I can get lawyers asking the right questions, I can get them to tease out if, if there is a problem in the relationship and it will usually be one of those five. Now, here's the brilliant thing about cross-selling, is that cross-selling eliminates many of these issues because you are institutionalizing clients by looking at their bigger picture and building stronger relationships. His thing. Cross-selling is actually very simple. It requires you to do two things. Number one, take some time to get to know your client's wider goals and needs. Number two, look around your firm. 
What do your colleagues do that can support your clients' goals or help them overcome their challenges? And if you're a single practice area firm or you're not full service, look at your intermediary contacts. If your client mentions that they're looking for tax advice, why aren't you telling them that you know tax advisors? That's it. Cross-selling lesson done. Of course, it's a little more complicated than that, and it requires you actually to learn the skills that I set out in precision selling. But at its most basic, cross-selling is simply getting to know your clients and matching their needs and their goals with people who can help them. If you can do that, you are making it rain. You are a rainmaker. And what I really want us to take away from today is, again, come back to this idea, you know, not Wolf of Wall Street. We're doing those two things. We are taking the time to get to know our clients and we are matching needs with people who can help. Hopefully that starts putting people a bit at ease in, the, in how we cross sell. So now I'm going to move on to outbound selling. When I talk about outbound selling, this is cold outreach to sell to companies, not individuals. <clears throat> when it's done properly, outbound selling doesn't breach GDPR. It doesn't breach any other data protection laws. And the methodology that I use has been checked and cleared by compliance officers and data protection lawyers. My favourite posts and comments on social media always come from people who write outbound selling or cold outreach doesn't work. What they actually mean is I hated cold calling. I wasn't very good at it. I never won much business that way. That must mean it doesn't work. But it's like saying that content marketing or brand building or social media don't work. <clears throat> the latest example being the audio chat platform Clubhouse. For those of you who are aware of it, it, as I say, you can enter rooms and listen to conversations on, on various topics, everything from business to sport to films, television. It, it's the, it's the, the full range. But if you go on there and spend no time on it and have, you know, don't get involved, then obviously you're not going to build a network. But as with everything, get involved and you'll meet people from all over the world. The same thing applies to any type of marketing or sales. If you're going to try it once and expect an instant impact, you, it's, it's never going to work. Now, the difference, I suppose, if I'm thinking about it, is that you can try social media, can't you? And you're not going to get hurt if no one responds to your post. But if you call a prospect and they tell you they're not interested, that feels like it's going to hurt a lot. feels like it's going to be oh, pretty painful. Why would we put ourselves through that? So actually what we've done is we've convinced ourselves that outbound selling is the persona non grata of business development, not to be touched. Yet it's the backbone of selling in the world's largest economy. And a survey undertaken in 2018 by Selling Power, uh, a US based insights company, they asked B2B salespeople which methods were best for reaching prospects, and it produced the following results. Clara, is it up? Just move on to the, yeah, the, thank you very much. So here you can see the results. Now, it shouldn't surprise anybody that referrals came top. If you've got a client who likes your work, and you know they have a contact at a company that you, can, that you want to work with, why wouldn't you ask for an introduction? The key here is feedback and recommendation, but that's not the point of today. After referrals, the best way to reach a specific prospective client as opposed to your ideal client type is cold outreach. Do you know, for example, that you want to reach the FD of a company, but she isn't active on social media and she's based at the other end of the country? How are you going to reach out to her? 
There's only one method for it. There's only one method for targeting a company or an individual directly, and that's outbound selling. The problem actually isn't outbound selling itself. The Rain Group conducted a survey that found that 82% of buyers accepted meetings from salespeople who reached out to them in the last 12 months of this pandemic. And 69% of buyers accepted cold calls from new providers. That is a, that's pretty good. Now, the Rain Group actually went further and found that top performers earned the lion's share of results, generating around three times more meetings than the rest of their team. So if you get good at this, if you get consistent with it, and if you are what I call professionally persistent, you can be in that top performer segment. You can be earning the lion's share of results. So if businesses are taking meetings and they're taking them from outbound sellers, where are we going wrong? The problem is how we go about it. Now, very often we move too quickly. We want to make contact with people as quickly as possible. So we don't do enough and we don't do the right preparation. And actually it can be a strategic problem as well. Sometimes we know we want to work with a potential client, but we don't really know why. And, uh, and we haven't developed that strategy for targeting prospective clients. So the focus of our research is all wrong. What we're doing is we're spending all this time perfecting how we talk about our offering when we should be researching the prospect and what they want to achieve. That way we can better establish whether we can help them and how. And this research has to come before we've even made contact. That's why in precision it comes before it comes research and then encounter. So we can use corporate research tools. We can use search engines. We can use websites, blogs, companies, house records, so much more to get us a picture of a prospective client. And it also means that when we reach out to them, whether it's by email or on social media or by phone, we know enough about them to tailor the conversation and make it all about them. Because that's where we make our second mistake. If we're setting up a meeting with a prospect, we want them to know all the things we do as, a, as an author, right? No, no. Clients and prospects don't actually care what practice areas we cover or the latest deals we've worked on. They don't. They only care about one thing, and that is how can you help them? That's really important. How can you help them? And how can you help them if you're not focusing the meetings on them? So if you aren't asking the right questions that tease out the important information, if you're not listening carefully to their answers, but instead you're sat there thinking, how can I bring our services into the conversation? If you're spending more time talking than the prospect is, and really important here, if you're not providing insights relevant to their industry, then you aren't adding value to the conversation and you're not giving the prospect a reason to keep talking to you. Providing insights is massively, massively an important part of, of the conversation you have with clients and prospects. The more they know that you know about them, their industries, their lives, the more value you're adding, the more likely you are to continue the conversation. So here's what I want you guys to be thinking about when you are contacting a, a prospect. They don't want some kind of script. They don't want some kind of fancy opener. They want to know why you're contacting them. They don't want to schedule an appointment. What they want to know is the value of continuing the conversation. They actually may not want to use your legal services at this moment. Stop selling to them, stop talking to them like they do. 
What they want are smart questions. They don't want questions that feel like some kind of interrogation that are leading them down a path that's just going to lead to your services. And they want to know that you've done your homework. And, you know, just knowing about their favourite football team or their favourite meal isn't going to cut it. And the reason that this is important, <clears throat> Claire, can we bring up slide seven, please? Yeah. OK, perfect. So what we've got here are the four levels of value creation. And I'm going to take you through briefly what they are. So level one is the service. And this is we provide legal services. It's the most basic. Okay, We don't promise a level of service. We don't promise we'll call you back. You know, that's why you pay bottom dollar. Is we just provide legal services. Then you've got level two. Now, here's a law firm that provides outstanding levels of service. They will get back to you. They will answer your emails. They will call you. They will keep you updated. They'll provide you with the latest app that can make life easier for you to keep in touch. Here's the thing about level two. If you're doing it right, you're reaching out to prospective clients or they've come to you, you can steal every client from level one. Then we move up to level three. Now we're talking about law firms that get results, that are problem solvers. Oh, I go to them because anytime I've got a problem, they know how to deal with it. OK, they do everything at level two and level one, but also they are problem solvers. They get results that are needed. Again, done right. They're stealing every client from level one and level two. But then you've got level four. You've got the trusted advisor. The trusted advisor is adding value. They're doing more than solving problems. They're providing insights. They are working at a strategic level. They're giving you the kind of advice that you can trust. And that doesn't, that's not limited. As I said earlier on, it doesn't have to be limited to legal advice. They come to you and they say to you, Scott, I'm looking for, I'm looking for someone to help in this particular area. It's not legal. I just wanted to know if you can help. Yeah, I know somebody. Let me put you in touch. If they know that they can come to you for these things, they know that they can come to you when the strategic decisions are being made. And that's really, really important because if you're at level four, you are stealing clients from every level below. Because you are at the top level. If you're doing your work, if you're doing your selling properly, you are going to steal clients from every single level below. Now, Again, in my, in my training courses, I talk about relationships and the types of relationships that we want with our clients. And relationships are important, they really are, but it's trusted relationships. Those relationships where you are creating more value, they're even more important. So, for, so, so let's think of it this way. <clears throat> if you're offering and your competitors offering are the same, then whoever's got the better relationship is going to keep is going to win the client because there's no other differentiator. If your competitor's offering is better than yours, then you're going to need to have a really strong relationship to keep that client. And even then, you're only going to hold on to them for so long. If you want to win any client, you need to create the kind of deep relationship that's based on strategic outcomes. And again, as I said before, that doesn't matter whether it's corporate clients or individual clients. We're all making strategic decisions. Now, level four, trusted advisor, creates the reason to do something different in the first place. Level four provides that compelling reason to change. You've provided them with that vision of a better future. That level, that level four, 
that serves in a business anyway, it serves the uh, the executive leadership. It's strategic. It trumps all other levels. Now, the problem the product providers have got is that they focus on the strategic level very often at the expense of those who are actually going to be using the product day to day. And that disconnect is what causes low engagement with the product. And I'm sure there aren't going to be many of us on here that aren't thinking CRM. CRM gets very low engagement because we because they focus product providers, CRM providers focus on the strategic level to get the product brought in, but don't then follow up by actually working with the people who are going to be doing it day to day or helping them to understand why it's so important. A legal service is a different strategic level is what matters because you're going to be dealing with the strategic level day to day. Again, that's the same whether it's corporate or an individual. Claire, do I have time to have a quick to have a few minutes on CRM? Yeah, I think you have. Yeah, you should be fine. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to have a quick word about CRM because once you understand 21st century consultative selling, then you've got to be able to manage your leads. And I want to tell you a story about CRM. A number of years ago, when I was working at a law firm, we wanted to really up our, our selling capability and sat down with my boss at the time and we were talking about how we were going to do it, how we were going to go out into the marketplace. And I said, well, you know, brilliant. I'll take care of that. But we need to we want to do this at scale. We want to get more lawyers involved in doing this because the difference that that will make will be just just huge. But if we're going to do this, we need people to be using the CRM system. Because you can't do you can't you can't undertake business development. You can't undertake selling at scale by using your calendar and using a spreadsheet. And the you know my boss at the time they said, Scott, by all means you go ahead and use CRM. You will not get people here using it. So I said to them, I said, would you do me a favour? Would you think of a client that you haven't seen in say the last nine to twelve months? After about 10, 15 seconds. They said, yep, got somebody. I said, do you remember where you last, where you met them last? They said, well, it was either at the office or it was at a restaurant. OK, fine. Do you remember what you said? And they said, well, I'd, probably, I'd be pretty sure I, let, I, I wrote the, the notes down in my notebook. OK, would you do me a favour and, and just go and get that notebook? See if you can find it. Off they go. About 10 minutes later, they come back. I've looked through three of my notebooks. I can't find the notes. We must have gone to a restaurant. OK, fine. Can we try? Can we just try something? Would you just give them a call and say hello and, and you know, have a catch up with them? And I swear to you, this this is what happened. And I had no idea it was going to play out the way that it did. Phone up the client, have a quick hello. They start chatting and the client says, do you remember when we met about 18 months ago? And we were having a chat and already, already my boss is looking at me 18 months. I thought it was, I thought it was about nine months ago. 18 months. Remember we were talking about how we would, how we were thinking of, of going ahead with, with something. I didn't give you much detail at the time, but I, you know, I said that we, that we keep in touch. Okay, fine. Do you remember that you, you know, you kind of said to me that you'd give me a call back in a few months. Anyway, never heard from you about six months later we decided to pull the plug on an acquisition uh, sorry push the button not pull the plug push the button on a company acquisition so I said, okay and at the time we were working with our accountants and they happened to just say to us look we know someone who's a specialist in this area would you be willing to have a chat with them about it just go ahead. and i thought okay fine things moved really quickly had a really good conversation with this with this specialist lawyer and we went ahead and used them. My boss was on the phone, looking already down at the at the table, and they said, "Just have an interest. What were the fees on that? 150 grand." Well, I sat there, and I felt slightly uncomfortable at how this had all played out because this wasn't this wasn't how this was supposed to go. 
it certainly made my point. It wasn't how it was supposed to go. Anyway, uh, my boss at the time, they continue the conversation for a couple of minutes more. And then they say to the, they say to the client, look, I'm going to get back in touch with you. We'll have a catch up. We'll go out for a drink. OK, per perfect. Put the phone down. Scott, do not say a word. I know exactly the point that you are making. Let's let's just look into this. The problem that we have as an industry with CRM is that we see a system that can do a million different things. And we're given 30 minutes training on the whole thing. And when we play with a computer game, we don't start off at level 150. And we start at level one and we're shown exactly how to do everything. Same with level two. And this keeps happening until we've learned enough of the basics to get us going in the game. Now, that's how it should be with CRM. You need to know four basic things to get really good at it. Number one is inputting or adding uh, contact details. Number two, adding activities and related notes, where you went, what was said, what the agreed follow up was. Number three is setting reminders so that you can actually do that follow up you said you were going to do. Number four is using the search function. If you can use the search function in 10 seconds, you can find out the latest information about when you last met that, that, that client or prospect. <laughs> don't have to look through three notebooks, don't have to take 15 minutes to do it. But here's why it is actually so important that we start using CRM. How do you expect to build trust with clients and prospects if you can't keep your word? How can you keep your word if you can't easily find your last contact point and what your agreed actions were? You don't need anything else to get you started. Reporting functions, those can wait. All those amazing things that the CRM can do, they can wait. Get those four things down and everything else follows there. You need a CRM system so that you can regularly update yourself on where you are with clients and where those clients and prospects are in the sales process. That's why CRM is so important. It helps you achieve consistency and professionalism in your BD approach. Now, apologies for that. We haven't even begun talking about how to deal with objections or hesitations, how to close a prospect, how to build a culture of business development within your teams, or really importantly, how you build the right kinds of relationships with clients, because it's not necessarily what you think it is. All of this is for another time. Now, for today, I want to finish off by just leaving, making sure that you are leaving here knowing four things. Number one, cross-selling to your existing clients are your easiest wins. Get to know your clients, understand their wider business uh, or personal goals, and find colleagues or contacts who can help them. Number two, outbound selling absolutely does work and it's got to be part of your overall business development strategy. If you've got a target list or specific prospect uh, prospect list, outbound selling is going to be your most effective way of reaching out to them. But like any form of selling, outbound won't work unless you commit to it. Have it part of your strategy, teach your lawyers how to do it and work on it consistently. Number three, if you aren't conducting proper research on your targets before you make contact with them, you're going to be missing vital bits of information that can help you gain insights on them and give them insights. And it can be the difference between winning and losing them as a client. And number four, CRM is your best friend when it comes to business development. If you want to be a trusted advisor, it starts by keeping your promises and you can't do that at scale as I said before, using your calendar and a spreadsheet. So thank you very much for listening to me. I, I really hope that's been useful. And if we've got any questions, I'd be delighted to, to take them. Absolutely. No, that was really interesting, Scott. It's so thoughtful just hearing your take on it. And I know with a lot of the stuff you were sort of 
some of it you feel perhaps it's really easy to apply it to sort of a commercial client but it is just as easy to apply it to sort of the private client side as well because it, it th there's so many examples I can think um Firstly, I had my will written by a law firm who will remain nameless, and I know I haven't heard from them since. And I keep thinking I need to update my will, but they haven't got in touch to ask me. Um, and also uh, another firm that sprung to mind is a small firm in a small market town. And they were sort of laughing um, because they get clients literally come and knock on the door with all sorts of questions. But I think it's just anything that sort of complicated and perhaps paper-based they pop along and see them because they know they'll help and they're sort of like oh the things we deal with but they deal with them and it's the same principle they are that go-to trusted advisor for anything that's a bit complicated and I think you know it, it applies so much in both fields and you wouldn't always think that. A absolutely Clara the, the reality is is that all of that time that they are spending with with those clients helping them out with those little things they they will mean an awful lot to those clients and if they've if they've developed that right kind of relationship with them when the time comes and they need something big they won't question the cost because mm -hmm. you've developed that trusting relationship that means yeah whatever it costs i'll pay it yeah absolutely absolutely right we have got a couple of um questions come in so um someone said what would you give in terms of tips on how to network and places a new lawyer can network? Right. So this is a great question. Thank you so much. Um, networking. Firstly, and we talked about this before, didn't we? Actually, social media has has really it's it's democratized marketing because anybody can get involved in social media. But you can now network with anybody from anywhere in the world. If you go to face to face networking, uh, you know, uh, if you, sorry, if you go somewhere for face to face networking, you're usually within, you know, probably a 20 mile radius of where you are. You're not going to be going too much further. That really limits you in a massive way. But social media allows you to, to you know, network and, and, and get involved. I would really, really encourage people to get onto places like LinkedIn. The opportunities on there at the moment are huge. The, the ability to find your ideal clients on there is massive. And all you need to do is find any content that they are producing and engage with it. You don't necessarily have to start by posting your own content if it's not something you're quite comfortable with. But, you know, think about, think about, engaging with other people's content it it builds it starts a relationship and builds a relationship like, like you wouldn't believe if you're going to a face-to-face -face network preparation is the key think about what you want to achieve from it find out if you can find the attendee list see who's who's going that might be of interest to you find them go and talk to them you know don't be, you know, remember that not everybody's going to know everybody. And so you are going to be in a very similar position to other people. But being prepared, knowing who you want to meet is going to give you an awful lot more confidence because you're going to search those people out. Hope that helps. <laughs> Absolutely. I always um, think as well in terms of law, like I say, we work with a few of the junior lawyers divisions and they're really good organisations. But if you are a junior lawyer, um, then you also get the young professionals groups, which, again, it's a good place to start if you're doing face to face because everyone's in the same boat. So, you know, that can make you feel a bit more confident as well going in because you know that everyone's at the beginning of their careers and everyone's sort of, you know, taking their first steps into networking, which can be helpful too. Yeah. No, fine. Um, someone else has said, in terms of the outbound selling, how do you reconcile cold calling with the conduct rules that prohibit soliciting? Right. So this is a really, really interesting question. OK, so... The, the conduct rules and uh, GDPR, they were, they were never designed to stop B2B selling. They, they weren't. What they were designed to stop was 
you know, in, in terms of GDP and even the, the conduct rules, they were designed to stop this mass mar that this mass marketing that just hits everything. That means you're getting phone calls at 7.30 at night for PPI or internet or something like that, where you have no idea who you're calling and you are disturbing them. You are, you know, it, it's supposed to stop people who have, who have, say, been in an accident from getting swamped with with letters and phone calls. Not that it has stopped, I have to say. I, I get them and I haven't been in an accident. I'm still getting these phone calls. So they, you know, the, the point of it is this. If it is B2B and it is targeted and it shows and you can show that you've done your research on them, it doesn't breach any rules. We have had, you know, this methodology that, that we've looked at that I've been using for a number of years. As long as you are targeting businesses and you are targeting them because they because they meet the work that you do or the work that they do when you've done the research on them and you know that they've got something up that you can help with and that you are being very, very specific about your your communication. What we tend to what 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 I tend to do with clients is I'll do that kind of research that means my opening paragraph state shows that I know something that's going on with them, that I'm writing to them to congratulate them on a deal or an award that they've won or an acquisition or a sale or anything that shows that we have done our research on them. Doesn't doesn't breach the, the, the it's perfectly valid within the within the rules. So I suppose what you're saying there as well, Scott, is that you, you're approaching them with something more than just buy my new service. You, you're approaching them with a conversation. You're approaching them with sort of a congratulations or with something that's more than just a straightforward cold calling selling. Right. Yes, absolutely. It really does. When it comes to B2B, it has to be, it has to be very, 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 very specific, very clear that it is, it's meant for an individual and not this just mass, this massive. And also remember that what we all, what we also do is we're, we're not advertising in any way, things written down there, we're not advertising legal services. When we do what we do, we want to have a conversation with them because we want to provide insights. There's no denying that the end goal is we would like to work with these companies. But in none of the communications that we make, do we ever hint at any of our legal services. What we want to do is engage with people, provide them with insights, see what's going on in their industry. And actually the pandemic as, as, as you know, was an opportunity for so many businesses, because uh, for so many law firms, because businesses were crying out for information about what was going on. Mm, absolutely absolutely how would you sort of um flick that because some uh, they've put the quote up here about sort of approaches to members of the public with the exception of current or former clients how would that change in terms of approaching you know if you were looking at the private client side of things okay so remember that you know the rules are very specific about members of the public so your marketing has got to be very, very careful. As I say, you can't just go around, you know, with these, <laughs> with these, uh, with these marketing campaigns, uh, these letter drops and email drops that just go to members of the public uh, everywhere. That is, uh, that is against the rules. B to C is more is more tricky. There's there's no denying that. But again, that's where social media has been an absolute boon for for businesses. Because you have the opportunity on platforms like LinkedIn to tell the world what you do. If you are a private client lawyer, if you are a, a, a personal injury lawyer, and you can and you have the confidence to go out, and it doesn't take much, it just takes you to take that first step and, and write that first post. If you're providing insightful and helpful information on these topics, people will come to you and they will come to you a lot more than you imagine they will do. I cannot tell you the opportunities there are on LinkedIn at the moment. I, I'd given up on it a number of years ago, but over the last 12 to 18 months, LinkedIn has seems like a completely different platform. Mm -hmm. That's where I met you, Scott. We've not met in person, have we? No, 
And 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 the funny thing is, Clara, is that I haven't met any of my clients in person. Yeah. I've met them all through LinkedIn and online video chats. Not a single client have I met in in person. What what this, you know, what what Zoom and video chat, I know we talk about Zoom fatigue. You know, if you do it right, if you do it well, it's been incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's that reach, isn't it? It's just a reach that you can't get in person. So no, fair enough. We'll say that's there's no other questions come in at this stage, but that was all very interesting. Hopefully you all agree. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming along. We're going to um, we're going to pop. We, we are recording this. I've missed the front of the recording off, Scott. That's why you looked confused at the start. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we've got a recording, so we're going to send it out to people that didn't attend. We'll send it out to anyone um, who did attend as well, in case you missed anything. And obviously, you know, keep in touch. I do a monthly um, email out, which is sort of all things career related. I'm sure, Scott, that you offer various sort of keep in touch methods as well. And um, we will do a follow up to this as well. So um, you'll know where we are and have all our contact details if you want to get in touch. Yeah, and, and just one last thing, if you've got any other questions, I always say there's no such thing as a stupid question, just a question never asked. If you've got any questions, please, there'll be plenty of people on here who will be thinking it, but haven't. Please feel free to get in touch with me on LinkedIn or via the, via a website. I'll come back to you and we can we can chat with any of your questions. Fab. That's great. Thanks for your time, Scott. And thanks everyone for coming along. No, thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.